Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming to today's seminar. Um, this is all part of the Pomona Research and Mathematics Experience, where this summer, as part of the RU, we are focusing on the history of various African-Americans in the mathematical sciences. Today, it's a great pleasure to have Sashri Pantula, who is currently the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences at California State University at San Bernardino. And today, he and I are going to have a conversation about the late David Harold Blackwell. Um, Dr. Pantula recently served as Director of Data Analytics Programs at Oregon State University, and he's also served as Dean of the College of Science there at OSU for four years from August 2013 to August 17. Um, he also served as Director of the Division of Mathematical Sciences at the National Science Foundation. He has spent more than 30 years as a statistics professor at North Carolina State University, where he began his academic career in 1982. There at North Carolina State, he served as Director of Graduate Programs from 1994 through 2002, and also served as the head of the Department of Statistics from 2002 through 2010. He has been a leader in graduate education, developing partnerships with industry, including GlaxoSmithKline, Eli Lilly, Merck, and SES to develop, in, to, develop to increase graduate traineeships and fellowships. In all of his administrative roles, he has focused on enhancing the quality, quantity, and diversity within the department, the division, and the various colleges in which he's been affiliated. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to bring here um, Dean Pantula, who I can say has really been a great friend and a great supporter of mine for years. And it's been a great pleasure to be able to return that service. So Dean Pantula, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Ed Ray, and uh, to inviting me to speak to this Primes panel. I'm really looking forward to talking to the REE students. I wish I really could meet all of you in person. I hope all of you are doing very well, uh, fighting a couple of viruses plaguing our country, uh, COVID-19, as well as the systemic racism. Just know that we are thinking about you. So please do stay safe and speak up against racism. Again, I want to thank you for giving this opportunity to share with you the impact of one of my favorite persons, Professor David Blackwell. Thank you again. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, yeah thank you again, yeah, Dean Pantula. It's really, really kind of you. Um, well, I'm curious. How did you meet David Blackwell? Um, how has he influenced your life personally? Uh, that's a wonderful background, actually. Uh, when I was a graduate student, and in fact, undergraduate student at the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata uh, in mid-70s, mid in my statistics class, I recall learning about something called Rao Blackwell theorem. It's a very simple theorem. You take any estimator of a parameter of theta, and you can find an improved estimator of theta by simply taking the conditional expectation of this estimator with respect to a sufficient statistic. I mean, this is such a simple process, and the process is known as raw blackwellization of an estimator. Simple but very effective. So I knew Professor Rao because he was the director of ISI, but I would never knew who Blackwell is or was until after I came to United States. Um, and in fact, uh, first time I heard of, about him they, here was about uh, uh, Blackwell Tapia conference. That's first when I got to know that uh, in fact, Professor David Blackwell uh, is such a great man, but also that he was black. I did not even know that. So when I was the department head at NC State for the statistics department, we decided we need to talk more about his contributions and bring more visibility about him at NC State. So we worked uh, with the dean at that time um, and decided that we give him an honorary doctorate degree from NC State. 
So when I called Professor Blackwell to let him know, hey, we're going to be offering uh, you an honorary doctorate degree, he was so thrilled. And uh, he said, Sastri, I'm so excited to hear the great news. For well, one thing, I, I, I cannot travel physically uh, at this stage. So uh, we said, that's not a problem. This will give me an opportunity to come to Berkeley and visit you there. So Professor Weems, my, one of my colleagues, Kim Weems and me, we flew to California and met him at his house. It was interesting, I asked him, how, do you, how would I recognize your house? He said, Sastri, just look for the biggest Obama for president sign in the neighborhood. You will know our house. So that's how I found his house. Um, we had a great conversation, met his, met his son. And then we had a good brunch with uh, uh, his son, as well as several of his colleagues um, at a nice restaurant and uh, had delivered him, hand delivered him uh, the um, honorary doctorate degree to him from NC State. That was kind of really a moment for me to cherish all the time. And I got to know uh, his son at the time also. So when he passed away in 2010, the family actually invited me back to speak at his celebration of life ceremony. Uh, I was the, at that time, the president of the American Statistical Association, I also was working at um, NSF as the division director. So I came and talked, uh, met again, all his friends and family at that time. It was, uh, I was very honored. You're seeing his son's picture there um, at the restaurant. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to organize a session at the joint statistics meetings in Denver to celebrate his 100th birthday. And we had uh, three different people uh, who spoke there. One of them is a close friend of mine, Professor Jackie Hughes Oliver uh, at NC State. So some of the things that I'm going to talk to you today is from her talk as well as she has published a couple of articles in the Amstead News about him. So I'm uh, really grateful for Jackie to allow me to share some of the information from there. We also had his colleague, Peter Bickel, who spoke uh, about how he was a great colleague. And then we also had his 63rd PhD student out of 65. He came, Robert, Lo uh, sorry, Richard Lockhart. Uh, he came and spoke also. Um, so I'm going to kind of summarize some of the things that I know about him, um, as well as I had the honor to work with Ed Ray and Nam uh, to raise funds for Blackwell Seminar um, through Nam Golden Anniversary Fundraising. So that's just some of the background of my connection with him, uh, starting with learning about raw Blackwellization to uh, honorary doctorate degree to 100th uh, year birthday celebration. Right. Now, that, that really is fascinating. Well, let's see. Last year, uh, 2019, was his celebration of his 100th birthday. So let's maybe go back to the beginning then and try to talk about who he was as a person, how he grew up. So I guess he was born in 1919 in Centralia, Illinois. So who was he growing up as a kid? Growing up, uh, he's uh, kind of like uh, the first generation um, uh, uh, person. His father, uh, I mean, he was born during the time of uh, recession and racism, uh, kind of some similarity to what's happening right now, unfortunately. Um, he was the first in his family to go to college. Father is a railroad worker with only fourth grade education. And mother left high school in her second year and worked as a housewife, but his parents, his grandfather, and one of his uncles are really, really committed to seeing him and his siblings to be very well educated. He's the oldest of four. Um, one brother became a lawyer. 
and another became a railroad worker. A sister became a school teacher. So he received real strong encouragement from uh, his math teacher, as well as uh, a math club director, and also an English teacher who really encouraged him to go on to college after high school. Mm -hmm. So he finished his BS degree at the age of 19, and then a master's degree by age of 20, and PhD degree at the age of 22. An interesting story uh, that he talks about, um, when he applied for his PhD program, he applied for some financial aid. And this is, I'm quoting from oral history by Professor Blackwell in 2003. I encourage people to listen to that, where he says, there were two kinds of awards, fellowships and teaching assistantships. They paid the same amount of money, but for a fellowship, you didn't have to do anything. So they were preferred award. They were the preferred ones. And there were maybe only three fellowships and 20 teaching assistantships every year. So one of his uh, other graduate students told him that I was going to get one of the fellowships. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, you're good enough to be supported and they're not going to put you in the classroom because I was black, of course, and he was right. Sure enough, I did get one of the three fellowships and I'm sure that a partial consideration was, well, we need to support this fellow and we can't put him in a classroom. So let's give him a fellowship. That's how he got into the PhD program. And wow. so go ahead. Well, what's always fascinated me about hearing about Blackwell is, um, you know, he grew up there in Illinois not very far away from there in Indiana, where you have the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. And it was very clear at the time, you know, Blacks didn't have opportunities. They definitely were not encouraged to go off to higher education. And here you have this young kid who's the first in his family to go off to college. He goes off to University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign at an early, early age and decides to go straight through undergrad, master's, PhD, finishes by 21 years old. Just the fact that everything around him says he shouldn't make it, he shouldn't do this. He should be a real world worker like his father. But yet he decides of all things he could do, he's gonna be a mathematician. And it, it just blows my mind that this is what he decides to do in his early 20s. Yeah, you're right. Uh, racism was all around him. He talks about uh, actually the segregated schools. Um, but the thing that he also credits is that uh, his parents, as well as other people who have really, really encouraged him to pursue his passion for mathematics. He always knew he liked mathematics. Uh, he liked geometry and he got real encouragement from his teachers. So uh, he does credit them quite a bit. Uh, in his um, uh, oral history. Uh, and he also talks about, actually, there is a YouTube video where he talks about his father and his work uh, and how he was committed to seeing uh, Professor Blackwell and his siblings to make sure that they get good education at that time. Right, right. Well, let's maybe try to, to move forward a little bit. Um, he finishes with his PhD um, age 21 in 1941. And what does he do from there? So he decides that um, uh, uh, his best employment opportunities may come from black colleges, uh, the now HBCUs. So he applied only to black colleges uh, at the beginning, all 105 of them. He also decided to drive to various colleges on the East Coast, about 30 colleges he went 
one after the other, starting with Morgan College, which is now called the Morgan State University. He went to Harvard University uh, and gave a talk, and but he didn't get the job at that time. He went on uh, all the way to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's where he first got his job in Southern University in Baton Rouge. Um, he taught there 1942 to 1943. He only taught the undergraduate courses, elementary undergraduate courses there. Then he moved to, in 1943, to Clark College, which is now merged with the Atlanta University, the Clark Atlanta University. So he taught there um, because Atlanta was kind of a um, good set of universities nearby, Morehouse College, Morris Brown College, Atlanta University, Clark University. So he was there. Um, uh, he thought that's a very good place to work. Mm -hmm. Then I think in 1944, he joined um, uh, Harvard University um, and, and stayed there for a while. I mean, he married um, Anne Ma Madison in 1944. He was promoted to full professor uh, and the department head in 1947 at Howard University. And, and then uh, he was moving to West Coast. So let me pause there in case you want to add anything before talk about Berkeley. Yeah, I, I do wanna, wanna talk about Howard because uh, my understanding uh -huh. is that those were kind of like the, the golden years of, of mathematics, if you will, that um, Albert Cox, you know, the first black PhD in mathematics, I believe he was department right. chair at the time when Blackwell was there. Um, maybe you had um, uh, William Clater was around for a while. I think that they had their master's degree program where they were trying to convince more students to go into mathematics. So I, I would imagine that Blackwell would have found that to be a very stimulating environment, that there he would be able, he would be encouraged to do research, to expand his ideas. And um, my understanding is that that's where he came up with the ideas for the Blackwell route theorem. Yes. You are exactly right. That's where he got the Rao Blackwell theorem. Uh, in fact, he got the Blackwell theorem independent of Rao, that uh, he published it, uh, and and Rao's work was in his thesis, and did not get as publicity until Blackwell published the result, and then it became Rao Blackwell theorem, and sometimes also Kolmogorov is added to that theorem. But I have learned it as Rao Blackwell theorem. But it was an exciting place to be at Harvard uh, when he was there. Uh, the, uh, also, the, not only the first African American PhD in mathematics was there, but also the third one, uh, and, and different mathematicians were there. And Professor Blackwell is actually the seventh African American mathematician to earn PhD in, in mathematics. And it's an uh, exciting time at that time at Howard University, stimulating for mathematicians, especially African-American mathematicians. Right. Can, can we maybe back up a few years? Um, Amy Oden has put a slide here on the screen that I wanted to ask you about. Um, I know that when he finished with his PhD, he did apply to lots of HBCUs and he did do a few visiting positions at places. And, and one in particular, the year that he graduated was the Institute for Advanced Study in right. Princeton. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the year that he was there, some experiences that he had? Yeah, it, it was interesting that uh, it wasn't clear whether he was welcome at Princeton at IAS. And I think the uh, president had to intervene and that, um, uh, but he was welcomed uh, when he did arrive at uh, the Institute. Uh, he did not know uh, all the back backstory of whether he should be there or not until later on. Um, uh, that's what my recollection is. Uh, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, related just to a little bit. I, I do know that that, that was kind of confusing what happened. My, my understanding is that the Institute for Advanced Study nowadays is considered to be separate from Princeton University, although there's an affiliation. 
But I believe at the time, uh, Blackwell was there in 1941-42, anyone who was affiliated with the Institute, even if they were a visitor, would technically be on the faculty at Princeton University. And that's where the controversy came in, that they didn't want any Negroes, as they called it at the time, on the faculty at Princeton. So it, it was just very unclear because he wasn't officially at the university, how much he was welcome, how much he wasn't. Um, but I do understand that, that that was somewhat of a tumultuous year, that he was only there for a year before he eventually decided to move on to, to Southern University. Yeah, 1942 was also the year for him, actually, when Jersey Naaman was introduced to David Blackwell and that uh, he interviewed uh, in the math department at Berkeley in 1942. But unfortunately, what happened there is that uh, the department head's wife, who frequently was hosting gatherings of the department, said she was not going to have the darkie in her house. So this is in 1942 at Berkeley, and therefore he wasn't hired until 1954 uh, as a visiting professor when he went to Berkeley. Right. And at that time, I think he became uh, a, a professor of statistics in 1955 after he joined there. The Department of Statistics was formed and he became a professor of statistics. But right. the Berkeley days, I mean, the, uh, he had the opportunity to interview, but uh, because of uh, the department head's wife, at least uh, he was not hired at Berkeley in 1942. Do you have any idea how this might have affected him as a person? You know, here you are, what, I guess he's around maybe 23 years old at the time. He already has this issue with the Institute for Advanced Study. He's applied to Berkeley. I, I think that he didn't know at the time what right. the department chair's wife had said about him, but still he applies to Berkeley, he doesn't get a position there. Um, he's at Howard now, he's proved, proved the Blackwell theorem. Roughly about this time, he's invited to speak for the International Congress of Mathematicians. But yet there's something about him that says, I'm going to give Berkeley another shot. And he decides and he does it. And he's he's now moving from the East Coast to the West Coast. Do, do you have any idea maybe in those 10 years he was at Howard, his mindset about things? So I am not sure, but I think at least the thing that is, is that uh, Jersey name and uh, had some influence in bringing him. Uh, he met Professor Blackwell in 37, uh, where Professor Crathorn, I think, introduced him uh, at a ASA chapter meeting or something like that. That chance introduction actually got him excited about uh, Bayesian statistics, and also had connection with uh, Rand to be a consultant. Um, so all of those things actually changed some of his visibility and also acceptance at uh, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So now here we are, 1954. He's, he's at Berkeley. He's a visitor there for a year. Um, it's a brand new statistics department that's created the next year, 1955. And then he becomes chair of the, the newly formed statistics department in 1956. So can you say a little bit about his, his early years there? At yeah, he becomes the chair of the department and serves until 61 and then becomes the assistant dean of the College of Letters and Sciences uh, between 1964 to 68. Um, he was really uh, recognized for his distinguished service and accomplishments at Berkeley. He was known as a great professor. Uh, and he's uh, recognized for knowing how to present things in a simple way uh, in, a, in his classroom. Um, talking about being simple, he talks about, uh, uh, or at least one of his students, uh, the 65 PhD students that he had there. Um, one of them talks about um, a paper that they submitted, uh, which was 30 pages long. 
and the journal rejected it. So Professor Blackwell said, let me take a look at it and takes a look at the 30 page one and uh, condenses it to nine pages and sends it back. And this time the paper gets accepted <laughs> to uh -huh. the co-author's surprise. So he was known for his simplicity and clarity of explanation in everything that he did. Um, so the thing that really is kind of um, the person who wasn't welcomed in 1942 at Berkeley, now in 2018, UC Berkeley has opened a new dorm named after David as David Blackwell Hall. So that's an exciting thing to see at Berkeley. Right, right. Um, I'm actually gonna ask um, Amy, she can pull up some of those photos uh, towards the very end. I actually, I visited Blackwell Hall um, just uh -huh. last summer, summer 2019. Uh, it's a beautiful location. I think that what's a little bit sad is, um, of course they're Berkeley undergrads there. It's a beautiful location. They're kind of going on their merry ways. Um, I don't really know how many of the younger students know who David Blackwell was. Um, I'm still very happy that that it's there. I'm really happy that that I was able to to take a look at it a little bit. But you know, it would be nice if, if there's a way that the students could really know how significant this is that there's yeah. a hall named after him. So at, at Berkeley, kind of, uh, uh, I just want to mention his uh, several major contributions to mathematics and statistics field not only directing 65 doctoral students, uh, he has published a number of papers and a couple of books. His contributions in game theory, Markov theory, Bayesian statistics, set theory, dynamic programming, information theory, renewal theory. I mean, a variety of things that not just one area that he has covered in terms of uh, uh, his research and contributions. And there are actually several things that are named after him besides the uh, new uh, dorm hall. Uh, there are Blackwell games. I talked about raw, raw Blackwellization, Blackwell channel, uh, Blackwell renewal theorem, uh, among many others. So I'm really excited about his major contributions to mathematics, probability, and uh, statistics. I want to ask you next about um, how a lot of the professional societies, how really the, the math and statistics cultures view Dr. Blackwell. Um, I know that um, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1965. Then he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1968. Um, and nowadays there's you know, various awards that, that are named after him. My understanding is that with the American Mathematical Society, that at one point he was vice president of the association, but right. Blackwell had never given an invited address for the AMS. I just found this out earlier this year. Um, could you maybe say with the American Statistical Association, um, how has he been viewed? What's the legacy that he's seen through the ASA. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, he was the first African-American Institute of Mathematical Statistics fellow. He was also the first African-American president of IMS in 1956. He was a fellow of the American Statistical Association, first African-American in 1962. Uh, as you mentioned, first African-American elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 65 and AAAS in 68. But in terms of, uh, I mean, he won, of course, won Human Theory Prize. He was the vice president of the American Statistical Association in 1978. Uh, he was also um, vice president of the International Statistical Institute, 75 to 77. And of course, AMS 68 to 71. Uh, he holds, I think, about a dozen honorary doctorate degrees. Uh, as you mentioned, MAA NAM Blackwell Lecture, Blackwell Tapia uh, was created. He was posthumously awarded National Medal of Science in 2014 by Obama. 
Um, in terms of uh, giving distinguished lectures at ASA, um, it's interesting uh, right now, he has given a uh, R.A. Fisher distinguished lecture at the uh, joint statistics meetings as a prestigious lecture, distinguished lecture. Uh, I, I'm saying that interestingly because uh, just within the last few weeks, American Statistical Association has decided not to call that a R.A. Fisher lecture anymore oh, because okay. R.A. Fisher was associated with uh, uh, eugenics research, uh, etc. So the American Statistical Association took a stand to rename R.A. Fisher lecture starting this August joint statistics meetings. But the thing that is is that Professor Blackwell gave our official lecture uh, several decades ago uh, for the American Statistical Association. No, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. I've actually been following that a little bit, some of the discussions over Twitter. I know that there's been a real big push, but it was unclear. Yeah, it has been changed now. Wow, that's really amazing. So. So, I, I mean, he has definitely a lot of uh, uh, accolades, awards uh, uh, in his life and well-deserved. Uh, right. Well, I, I can say um, I first met David Blackwell actually at, at one of these conferences that was in his, his honor, the Blackwell Tapia Prize. And I first met him um, back in the year 2000, the year that, that we had the prize. Um, I know that Carlos Castillo Chavez worked very hard to make sure that he and Richard Tapia would be there for that very first conference um, there at Cornell University. Um, and I'll just, just put this, this story out there just for the, the listeners. Um, at the time, I actually was finishing a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. And Bill Massey actually was working in Princeton at the time. He drove me from the Institute there to Ithaca so that we could both attend the conference together. And during that drive, he would tell me a little bit about David Blackwell and the work that he had done. That's when I learned about the issue that he had at the Institute back in 1941. So I was in awe that here I was in very much the same position that he was in, you know, a good, what, 60 years before. You know, and here he was, the great David Blackwell, that he's a very humble, unassuming person. Um, and I had to have my picture taken next to him and really knowing that, that he literally had paved the way for me to be able to be there at the Institute. But it had always amazed me that he was just such a quiet, humble person, considering all of these accolades and, and accomplishments he had. I'm glad you shared that. Uh, I know that um, um, Carlos and others have decided to start this at Cornell to recognize black and brown uh, mathematicians and statisticians, and I'm glad uh, now Blackwell Tapia Conference and the awards uh, are well known. Um, the one that I mentioned, my colleague Jackie Hughes Oliver, who I'm quoting several of the things today from her articles, uh, she received that uh, a few years ago, Blackwell Tapia uh, Award too. So I'm excited uh, for her. But the thing that I, I know, Ed Ray, you have gone through several things and uh, I do think it's important that um, um, African American uh, uh, students continue on to PhD and be successful in uh, academia. We have role models like um, uh, Professor Brackwell. And I think it's so important that uh, we enhance diversity, we encourage our students. And also, um, I know you have gone through a lot of experiences at Ray, and uh, this may not be the time to share, but the importance of uh, having a good support structure in academia and having role models like you uh, is very, very important. In that regard, I'm also delighted that this morning NASA announced that uh, one of the hidden figures, uh, Mary Wilson Jackson, that they're going to, they're naming the headquarters, NASA headquarters after her. Um, so I, I was, I mean, very delighted to hear that NASA announcement just this morning. Right, I heard that as well. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. 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 
So now, she, it, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask a little bit about um, along these lines, like perhaps the legacy of David Blackwell, what we can do to encourage more African Americans to to go on to to get their degrees. Um, as, as someone who's in the statistics profession, uh, can you say a little bit about what do you see is David Blackwell's legacy? What, what do you see as the influence that he's had on the profession? So uh, besides the wonderful impact in terms of his own research that he has published and being the uh, various roles in the like vice president of ASA, uh, as well as the uh, IMS president, uh, he has influenced by being the role model. But also, like you said at the beginning, how he pursued his passion for mathematics from childhood, given all the things that are going on around him, uh, whether it is the being first generation person or the racism or the recession, how he has thrived and has done so much uh, for mathematics and statistics. That's the passion that uh, I want our students, young students to remember is pursue your passion. Uh, the excitement that he had for geometry led to a lot of things uh, into the future. He also always, like you said, humble. He always kept things very simple. That's the thing that uh, I admire him whether it is his proofs or what I heard about his lectures, uh, keeping things simple, concise, straightforward, making difficult theorems to be uh, well understood by the students, care for students. He was always, that's something when I talked to some of his past students, I always praised him and, and his colleagues have praised him for his care for students and being accessible to students, making his lectures accessible to the students. And again, uh, like you said, uh, he's always modest, humble, lived a very simple life and role, for, role model for many of us. So for our young students in the audience, I would say, please pursue your passion uh, for mathematics or statistics or data science. We need you. We, the profession needs you. So keep up the good work. Yeah, yeah, no thanks. Um, I, I wanna read a quote here that's actually one of my favorite um, about David Blackwell. Um, he says, um, I'm not interested in doing research and I never have been. I'm interested in understanding, which is quite a different thing. Um, you know, I, I, I don't really know how many of our students understand the difference, you know, that, that you can certainly just do research. You know, you could call yourself a big fancy researcher, be at a fancy place like Berkeley, get plenty of awards and accolades. But I think when it really came down to it, David Blackwell really just wanted to understand. Right. And, you know, it, it is easy to get caught up in how many papers you can get published, whether it'll be in annals or whether you'll get the Fields Medal. But, but it really felt that he was just really genuinely interested in understanding what, what was happening. Um, I, I wanted to maybe turn things a little bit, and, and since since I have a dean here on, on the line, I um, wanted to help put this in context to ask you your thoughts on now that we live in an age where you see everywhere Black Lives Matter, you see various protests that are happening. Now, I'm thinking for someone like David Blackwell, he grew up in an era where it was very clear the system in lots of different ways was rigged against him being successful. Nowadays, though, I definitely worry about students that may be feeling overwhelmed, discouraged, and this might be from lots of different points of view. Um, the fact that COVID-19 is keeping them from attending classes, they don't know when they're going to see their friends again, the fact that there's a lot of concerns about the growing costs of college education. Even here at Pomona College, one thing I worry about with my students is trying to convince them to major in mathematics. Because the question is, why should I do it when I can make money going into computer science? I can make my parents happy by becoming an engineer or a lawyer. Um, I'm just wondering your thoughts as, as a dean, 
what are maybe some things that we can do to encourage our undergraduates, our African-American undergraduates in particular, to try to pursue a career in the mathematical sciences? Thank you. Um, let me just share a little bit about uh, my own background. My dad was a math teacher and he used to wake me up at four in the morning to teach calculus, not only just for me, but uh, for my classmates who would come all the way on bikes to listen to him. And he was an outstanding teacher. And the thing that is, is um, he encouraged me to pursue statistics. I did not encourage my daughter, but uh, she's now a freshman in mathematics at uh, UC Riverside. Um, uh, she's also missing her friends and all now uh, working from, uh, from home, learning things from home. But the thing that is, is mathematics is an invisible science or subject with impeccable impact. No matter what you're looking at, whether it is physics, chemistry, uh, astronomy, or biology, or computer science algorithms, all of them have mathematics as the backbone. Without that backbone, the other fields cannot thrive. So it's important that if you get trained in solid foundation in mathematics, you can do anything you want in any area that you want to go into, including being a professor or in academia, because we need in academia also. But mathematic mathematicians are there in the National Security Agency, one of the agencies that hires a number of mathematicians they're making wonderful contributions for cybersecurity or other things. Mathematicians are needed in the financial area. They're not needed in the actuarial science. So you can think of every field who needs mathematicians or statisticians. You can have lists from agronomists all the way to zoologists, A to Z, to show where you could have an impact. So I would strongly recommend like I, I recommend, I mean, no, I didn't recommend, but my daughter chose to go into mathematics because I think that's a field that is adaptable and you could learn whether you want to work at Google or any other place. You don't have to be a computer scientist. Good mathematics training takes you a long way. So I would encourage uh, our young fac uh, undergraduate students. REU is a wonderful thing to do, the research experience as undergraduates gives you some taste of uh, what mathematical field is. And we do definitely need diversity on our faculty. So as a dean, I would encourage you to pursue your passion, go on for PhD, go on either academia or industry or government, but think about academia as well. I wanna ask you this, as, as we're starting to get questions from individuals. Um, as a dean, and I'm sure that you've heard from students and probably other administrators alike about this phrase, data science. Um, I'm wondering, can you say a little bit about, for the undergrads that we have here, what is data science? And maybe as someone who's been, you know, department chair and who's been division director at the National Science Foundation, what are your thoughts on maybe the direction that data science might take the next few years? So that's a good question. And uh, I, I actually give a lecture on big data uh, at various places and its applications. Uh, when I was at NSF, uh, we worked on uh, big data solicitation. It's one of the top uh, priorities at NSF, harnessing uh, data revolution. So the thing that data science has different things for different people, but it does have a combination of mathematics, computer science, statistics, because it needs kind of at the intersection of all of them. And one cannot be all of them, but I think there is importance of learning what one can apply to the other fields and communicate with the other fields is important. Data science for some people could be data curation, data retrieval, uh, data management. But the important thing I see as data science is converting data into useful information. That's the thing. Data were hard to come by. 
But now with the fast computers and cheap storage, everybody is collecting data on everything. And therefore now they're asking the question, I have all of these data, what can I do with them? And people have figured out how to make money using the data. Data, again, I, I want to kind of leave with um, uh, uh, a knife analogy here. Data and statistics are like uh, a knife. In the hands of a sculptor, it could produce a good statue. In the hands of a surgeon, it could cure a person. But at the same time, in the hands of a crook, it could kill a person. So there are ways that the data could be misused or data science could be misused or statistics could be misused. And as Edra, you know that there's a good discussion that is going on whether mathematicians should help police in um, uh, algorithms, various algorithms about uh, hotspots of criminal activity or whether it is being misused uh, for profiling, racial profiling, et cetera. So the important thing is that the data science has a lot of future because whether it is Twitter, Facebook, or your um, uh, activities, uh, credit card activity, your travel activity, all of the data are being collected. Uh, it's not the big brother, it's the big companies that have found the best use of those things. So there's future in it. I would encourage to think about data science but good foundation in mathematics takes you a long way even in data science. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I have a wonderful colleague here um, at Pomona, Joe Harden, and um, she's given talks from my students before where she's really mentioned that when it comes to coming up with data for policing, you have to be very careful as to the ethics of whether the data is correct. Is there this thing of racial profiling? If we're saying that there's a lot of crime, let's say in the African-American community, is yeah. that real data or has it been biased in some kind of way? And my understanding is that there's a lot of undergraduate majors now in data science where the students have to take an ethics course. Absolutely. So they really have to be very careful as to the, the way that they're collecting the data, whether the data that they have is biased in one way or another. Absolutely. I mean, even the, some of the translation uh, ha, has bias in Google or other things. If you just translate one to the other, how it picks. Right. Uh, uh, so it all actually depends on how good our algorithms are and how what uses that they're being used uh, right. is very important. Right. Well, let's see, we have about five minutes to go. So I wanted to read off some of the questions that we have here in the window and, and hear your thoughts. Um, this question is from Jayla Langford who asks, who or what inspired you to go into higher um, administration in academia? For example, who inspired you to become a dean? That's a very good question. Um, first of all, I wanted always to be a professor uh, because of my father. He was an outstanding teacher. I enjoy teaching, so I wanted to be a teacher or a professor. So that's how uh, I got into the academia. Uh, the Why I became the dean or the department head, first the department head. And I, when I was the department head, uh, just like Professor Blackwell talks about lots of mentors and people who have helped him. For me, I had a lot of mentors. One of them was my former department head who became a dean uh, at NC State, uh, Dan Solomon. And I remember when I was a department head, and I was feeling that, I mean, that's a great job by the way, department head, because you have a lot of impact on faculty, hiring graduate students, undergraduate students, et cetera. So one day a headhunter called me, Sastri, uh, there's a position of a dean uh, that you have been recommended, uh, would you apply? I mean, this was my first call from a headhunter. Uh, these are the search firms that find people for uh, dean's jobs or provost jobs, et cetera. Right. So I finally asked the headhunter who recommended my name. They told me your dean. And I said, I went to the dean immediately and said, Dan, 
I thought you liked me. I thought you liked the job I'm doing. Why are you trying to get rid of me? And he said, no, Sastri, you have been doing this for a while. And I think that you're ready for the next level. I have confidence in you that you will be a good dean. Uh, that's why I was recommending you. So he was a great man. He, he's still alive and he's a great mentor and always a, a good ally, not just a mentor, but he's an ally who sponsored. That's what I think it's important, not just mentors, but who looks after you and looks to sponsor you at various things. And that's the reason, I mean, kind of the wind my, behind my wings that gave me the lift to be the dean. It's a great job. Uh, it gives me a bigger picture, just like being at NSF gave me the bird's eye view of the best research happening in the country. A dean is now looking at all the sciences, not just only mathematics or statistics. So it's a great job to have. I love my job. I love my colleagues here. Yeah. Well, I, I can say for one that San Bernardino is extremely fortunate to have you. So I, I, I'm really happy that you're here in the area. Um, let me ask another question. This is from Alexis Kelly. And she says, um, I like to ask this as a black female mathematician about to leave for undergraduate and is interested in graduate school. How should I search for schools that will support me as a black student? What were your reasons for choosing the graduate school that you chose? So I'll answer about how I chose later on, but uh, the thing that uh, in terms of uh, uh, choosing the appropriate school is very, very important. You want to have the culture that looks for the success of the student, not just checking off boxes. So I would encourage people to visit the department Good departments would always support you for the visit uh, at the graduate level, at least. The day. Uh, at NC State, there was something that I was very proactive. I was a graduate director for eight years. I had a good connection with Spelman College. I had a very good friend, Nagambal Shah. She was always kind of helping. Uh, and then we hired like Kim Weems from, uh, she was a Spelman graduate. Uh, but graduated from Maryland and uh, joined us uh, as a faculty member. Uh, Jackie Hughes Oliver, who is an African American female, also, uh, she joined as a colleague at NC State. Um, we hired other African American faculty. But the thing that is is at NC State, when I was there, at least we were uh, kind of recognized as one of the places making a difference by AMS. Um, um, uh, notices, etc. But the important thing that I would say is visit, learn about, uh, you attend AMS meeting or joint statistics meeting. There's always a um, uh, committee on minorities that discusses the graduate schools. They have people come and talk to these uh, at these conferences. I would encourage networking. I would encourage seeing who not just the pictures that they're posting, but who is graduating and where their graduates are going. It's very, very important. And I'll be glad to talk to you, email me. Uh, I'm on the Instagram. I'm also on my email address. I could email it to you or uh, uh, Edric would uh, share that with you. I'll be glad to talk to you at any time uh, if you want to choose from different places. Now, how I chose my PhD, I, I was interested in time series and forecasting methods. Uh, I, I had two choices. Uh, one was Iowa State and another is uh, University of Wisconsin. One of them, uh, I mean, I, I had researchers who I wanted to work with when I finished my master's in India. So I got offers from both, but then I chose to go to Iowa State. I'll just throw one quick thing. I applied to Harvard, but uh, I did not have the money to pay the application fees. In fact, I came to US with $20 in my pocket and a $2,000 loan. Uh, that's how I came to US, but I didn't have money to pay the application fee. Iowa State and Wisconsin told me it's okay uh, that you could pay when you come. Whereas Harvard told me if you cannot afford to pay the application fee, you're not going to survive at Harvard. I, I couldn't believe that's the letter I got. <laughs> so. 
Right, right. Yeah, no, that that's a story. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here because it's uh, right on the hour. So, okay. Yeah, Dean Panchula, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful conversation. I wish that we could really stay here longer and, and chat. I really appreciate this opportunity. And for all your students, uh, I will post my email address. Feel free to contact me at any time with any of your questions. As I said, I've served as a graduate director. Uh, we have had Math Fest and Stat Fest, Infinite Possibilities conferences, different things I was involved with. So I'll be glad to talk to any of you at any time. So, yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone.